Well, you know, what can you say? If the goal here is to talk about Mesda with a colorful past and a bright future, this morning has demonstrated it. With all of this morning's speakers, can there be any question about the colorful past of the last 50 years? <laughs> Although my Mesda Summer Institute class did not get to dance like Tom Savage's did. But in terms of embracing a bright future, I think so much of what we are doing now involves important initiatives like digitizing the Mesda Research Archives, embracing 21st century technology to reach those new audiences. And I'm so proud of getting to work with Gary Albert and his leadership on creating the Mesda website, taking the Mesda Journal online, turning the Mesda Craftsman database into something available to scholars around the world, free of charge, fully keyword searchable. And the crowning touch of that will be next year when the Mesda Object database joins those online archives. A lot of what we've done has been investing in MESDA programs, inventing new programs like the Saturday seminars, reinvesting in the critically important MESDA Summer Institute, and taking MESDA on the road and embracing institutional partnerships and having programs not just here in Winston-Salem, but going to Madison, Georgia, going to Knoxville, Tennessee, and Lexington, Kentucky, um, uh, to Harrisonburg, Virginia, to Charleston, South Carolina with our textile seminars. And our very next textile seminar next year will be in Athens, Georgia in partnership with Dale Couch and the Georgia Museum of Art at the University of Georgia. But we have to remember that our founder was at heart an archivist, a scholar, a collector. He was passionate about the critical objects that would become icons in what Mesda was and what MESDA always will be. So a big part of our work for the future has been revitalizing the collection. Now many of you read the catalogs and some of you were probably horrified when we began that deaccession program um, eight or nine years ago. But that was what allowed us to launch an acquisition program. And it was the acquisition program that allowed us to expand our regional diversity, to do better with our own backyard of Piedmont, North Carolina, to better represent the Shenandoah Valley, but most importantly, to more fully bring Georgia, Kentucky, and Tennessee into the Mesda collection. But there was another goal as well. We knew we had to expand the ethnic diversity of the Mesda collection. It's why we're so proud, and as you'll see this afternoon, to have a fully documented Thomas Day dressing bureau that came to us at, from a Ken Farmer auction with its original bill of sale in Thomas Day's own handwriting recognizing the important role of this free black cabinet maker who in 1850 owned the largest furniture factory in the state of North Carolina, who was a third generation free black slave owner, whose furniture factory had both white and black free and slave employees. And as we now know, because of the oncoming crunch of the Civil War, was, could not educate his children in North Carolina, had to send them to New England in order to get an education. And there, through visiting his children, for the visits, was able to get very quietly and subtly involved in the abolitionist movement. We were able to work out a trade with the Charleston Museum to bring in um, a wonderful sweetgrass basket from one of the Lowndes family plantations on the Santee River with a great history because it came from that plantation as an antique into the Charleston Museum's collection as an antique in 1902. We've been able to embrace Native American history and culture with things like this wonderful uh, sampler, a piece of needlework by a Cherokee girl with a new anglicized name, Eliza Baynard, done in the far reach of the mountains of Western North Carolina at the Valley Town Mission School. And I was so proud of my colleague Daniel Ackerman lecturing in Charleston last weekend about the role of Jewish material culture in Charleston, South Carolina, and the fact that he can show this spoon made by Hyman Samuel, one of the very few documented Jewish artisans working in the early South, first in Richmond and Petersburg, later moving to Charleston, South Carolina, and that those rare artifacts are here in the Mesda collection. So this afternoon, you're gonna be able to see the physical product, the fruits of those labors, with the new Shenandoah Valley Gallery, and the problem of any kind of a list is that it's never complete, but we're so grateful to the collectors and the scholars and the benefactors who've made that room possible.
We're so grateful to not have not one but three great rooms dedicated to Piedmont, North Carolina, and all that that is able to do, and I think you'll be impressed. But we're especially grateful with the fact that what we've been able to do to more fully embrace Kentucky and Tennessee and Georgia into the Mesda collection with furniture, paintings, ceramics, not only in dedicated rooms, but even integrated into the Masterworks galleries. And that would not have been possible with the help of so many people in this room from those three states, and we will be forever, ever in your debt. Now that doesn't mean that Mazda ignored its traditional roots in Tidewater, Virginia, or in the Carolina Lowcountry. When, when we had the opportunity to acquire the earliest example of signed Norfolk furniture, like the desk and bookcase that you see on the left, or the Jacob Sass clothes press that you see, uh, secretary uh, uh, bookcase that you see on the right, um, we knew we had to do that in order to be true to Mazda's mission and retain the quality of the collections from those important early coastal areas. But you'll get to see what we've been able to do with ceramics, particularly with the new Mariner Gallery and all of the rich diversity of all of the ceramic traditions that that brings together. And with needlework, a unique way to get to the lives of early Southern women and to do um, more with what, what women brought to bear and the kinds of artifacts that they could create with the new Whitmer Needlework Gallery. So therefore, we knew we needed to renovate the Mesda galleries, and we had to be open to experimentation, and we sought out the very best help, and we're so grateful to Ralph Harvard and to Barry Sidden for all they've done to make us able to do that. Part of what you'll see this afternoon are 29 fully renovated galleries, plus the Mariner and McNamara galleries, which give the public a chance to experience the Mesda collection in new ways, under new lighting, new exhibition methodologies, in a way that we think is rich and colorful and powerful, as rich and colorful and powerful as the objects themselves. We've developed new tour options. Many of you know that in the old days, the only way to experience the Mesda collection was through that two-hour guided tour, which we like to joke in the end, with, in a changing world of different museum audiences, could quickly become, for the average person, what we call the Southern Decorative Arts Death March. <laughs> And that for a lot of families with children, after the first hour was over, their only question was, how much is the ticket out of here? <laughs> so we've adapted and we've changed and we've created a shorter general public tour that can be done in 45 minutes looking at 12 rooms. But for those who want the full two-hour experience, we still offer that at a connoisseurship level. We've developed specialized tours focused on African-American history, um, focused on the role of women in early Southern decorative arts, and now, as you'll see, we have over 3,000 square feet of self-guided space, even embracing the technology of iPads, where you can go and touch the object and pull up all the photographs and all the information about it. But part of what I'm most excited about is what we've been able to do with institutional partnerships. Um, recognizing that within the confines of Winston-Salem, we do have to get out more. We have to partner with the Chipstone Foundation on initiatives like Art and Clay. We have to work with our colleagues at Winter Tour on important projects like Paint Pattern and People, and to have a very rich and rewarding partnership with Ron Hurst and all of our colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg in Carolyn Weekly's groundbreaking ex exhibition and book, uh, Paintings and Painters of the Early South and a Rich and Varied Culture. So in the end, I think it is so much of what Van had to say. Words and things coming together and the words and the stories that these objects of the Mesda collection can tell. And for that collection and the words and the stories and the power that they convey, we can all always be grateful to that founding visionary, Frank Horton, and recognize that at this day, at this moment, we're going to celebrate that colorful past, but we're going to anticipate all working together, everybody in this room dedicated to it, a very bright future. Thank you very much.